Excellent. Well, first off, thank you for inviting me to talk about the in the focus on Forge uh, webinar session over here. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about potato leafhopper management in alfalfa. And we're going to be kind of walking through some recent research findings that uh, Mark Renz and his postdoc Rehan and I have worked through over the summer. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm still somewhat new. I'm a, a somewhat new UW-Madison faculty member. I've been an assistant professor of precision pest ecology in the Department of Entomology since July 2022. Um, we, I run the uh, newly branded Original Digital Entomology Lab, and my purview is field and forage crops. And just because I'm new, I feel somewhat obliged to go through kind of the research goals of our lab. So we're trying to develop this fundamental understanding of insect population dynamics, how insects are moving and changing over space and time. We're trying to translate that understanding into novel tools and strategies that enable data-driven decisions. And though I'm not talking through any of kind of the, the digital entomology focused ideas uh, in my lab, expected in the future, since the approach we like to take uh, is fairly statistical, fairly sensor and model heavy. And my background is not at all in alfalfa. I have three degrees in entomology, uh, first at Cornell, where I was focused on mosquitoes. Um, I moved to the Midwest and was working on emerald ash borer. This is a list of all the places I've swung a sweet net pretty much. Uh, and then I, I did my post, uh, my graduate work at UC Davis, working on strawberries, grapes, and an invasive aquatic weed. Um, and then I, I went off to Europe and started working on some sensor work. Now, today we're going to be walking through the potato leafhopper. Uh, this insect feeds on way more than just alfalfa. I think from the name, you can understand that it's a bit of a generalist. Uh, it will attack clover. It'll attack most types of beans. Uh, you can recognize it because it's this small, about an eighth of an inch long, um, bright kind of neon green wedge-shaped insect. And per its name, it'll hop. It'll start jumping when you disturb it. And if you wanted to try, you could poke it a couple times and the jumps will get uh, smaller each time. So its escape mechanism only works a couple times. Uh, it falls into the true bug category, which means that it has piercing sucking mouth parts. And it also means that its nymphs or its immatures look almost identical to the adults, except they're a little bit more translucent and they don't have wings. From a life cycle perspective, uh, at least in the state of Wisconsin and the northern mid Midwest states, these adults have to migrate in. Uh, they migrate in kind of mid to late May, uh, and they actually go through three to four generations for their life cycle. Uh, the adults will come in um, with these yeah, lime green, neon green um, shaped bodies, and they'll start laying eggs. And some of the work that Mark and I conducted was about where and when these insects are laying their eggs and where they're actually developing. Uh, they'll actually put their eggs directly into alfalfa stems, which and I'll talk about weather in a little bit, but which should actually protect them from some weather, uh, protect them from freezes because they won't freeze unless the plant uh, it freezes. But these eggs will actually hatch over the course of 10 to 12 days, and then they'll develop into these nymphs or instars one through five, uh, with the first instar being the smallest and the fifth being the largest. Uh, you can tell that they're nymphs because they don't actually have uh, wings yet. Only the adults have wings. However, these five instars of nymphs are where most of the damage occurs. And this is where I want to kind of pivot to what's actually happening in alfalfa. So after the second cut, these uh, potato leafhoppers can do some, some substantial damage to alfalfa stands. They both directly reduce yield, um, or I should say indirectly reduce yield because they're feeding on kind of the plant juices. And they also diminish forage quality, which is really important. Now you can start to tell if they're there or not from this kind of yellow or chlorosis discoloration 
of the leaflets, which you can see on the right in the picture over here. And when you're taking a peek, you'll immediately start thinking, oh my goodness, this could be herbicide burn. I know what, I wanted to tie this into what Mark just talked about, but one of the key differences here is that uh, yellow chlorosis really begins at the tip and then of, of those leaflets, and then it progresses towards the base of the plant in this V-shaped pattern. Uh, conventionally, it's called hopper burn or tip burn, but as, as time goes on, this uh, chlorosis or chlorotic area becomes more purplish in color rather than kind of a yellow or a, a lighter green. And if this is severe enough, we'll start to see some of the leaflets turn brown and die. And if it's extremely severe, the plants can very easily become stunted. Potentially there can be some uh, stem kills or entire uh, plant or stand kills. Okay, so what do you do when you think you have a potato leaf hopper? Well, step one is to go through kind of a scouting pattern. And this is standard, right? So you use a sweep net, uh, you use 20 consecutive sweeps. You want to test five different locations because the insects are found at kind of a patchy area or clustered in different parts of the field. And you really want to start doing this after the first harvest, not before. It shouldn't be problematic before. And then we've got some leafhopper thresholds that UW Madison developed on the bottom over here. And this, each of these thresholds is per sweep. So if you're looking at the, the three inch alfalfa and you're talking about 0.2 um, insects per sweep, that means for each of your 20 sweeps, if you have four or more uh, individuals in your sweep net, then it's time to do something. It's time to treat. And by the way, the treatments are very much state by state dependent. So make sure that you're looking at what is available and registered in your state for potato leaf hopper. And if you need kind of a review on sweet net uh, and using a sweet net and alfalfa, I think this is one of the first YouTube videos I conducted when I joined UW Madison. So this is up on the on YouTube or the Crop Protection Network. You can take a, a little bit of a review there. Okay, so now I'm going to pivot into this research study that was conducted in uh, mostly actually by Mark Renz, who we just heard from, and his postdoctoral fellow, Rehan Shahib. Now, this was funded, I think, by the Dairy Innovation Hub, and it has to do with alfalfa that's been interseeded into corn after the first year. Uh, they set up these three separate locations in Arlington, in PDS, and in Lancaster, trying to be a little bit spatially distinct. Um, there were actually six different sampling uh, times across kind of the middle of July and the middle of August, uh, 70 total sampling points. And we were really trying to see kind of how clustered or patchy potato leafhopper was in alfalfa. So this is what kind of the, the transects and the lines looked like in that grid sampling pattern. And you can see Rayhan going out and sampling. Now, we found a couple critical pieces. The, the first finding was that potato leafhoppers are actually clustered, meaning that like most other insects, they're not found uniformly distributed equally across the entire alfalfa stand. In fact, the adults are a little bit less clustered than the nymphs. So those nymphs are primarily found on the edges, especially in the mid to late season points. Okay, so what is the, the big takeaway? Why do we care that that alfalfa, uh, that potato leafhopper were clustered? Well, it means that the adults, when they migrate in or when they um, kind of emerge and go through their life cycles, they are primarily laying their eggs on the edge of the field. Nymphs, because they don't have the ability to fly, uh, they can't disperse as well. And they are mostly staying on those edges. And you can see that in red on something called a, a spatial analysis by indices plot, a SABI plot on the right over here. So that means that when you're scouting, and you're scouting specifically for nymphs because they're uh, causing most of the damage. If you're just walking on the edges, you're likely to way overestimate your actual population of potato leafhopper in your alfalfa stand. But it also means that there might be some potential to focus some of the treatment efforts on those nymphal populations on the edge. Um, thinking about 
at, about those pieces. Now I talked to Scott Newell yesterday and we, I think yesterday it was about 60 degrees out and today it's 16 in Madison, Wisconsin. And I, I, he asked me about what is happening with insects with this wild set of weather swings. I think it was like a 50 degree weather drop between the two days yesterday and today. And there are really three different case studies or three different ways to think about insects. And I'm gonna use Scott's, it depends on whether this could be a good year or a bad year for these types of insects. So the case one is the insect ph uh, phenology is often going to be mismatched with the crops, right? Where if insects actually get an earlier start date, their, uh, their phenology, their, their development times are driven primarily through weather, through temperature, through that kind of degree day accumulation, which means that even though if, if we plant our crop at the same time, then the phenology of the insect is going to not match the crop and will be kind of a better uh, insect year. But if we're talking about the second year or greater uh, stand of alfalfa, oh my goodness, that's out already right now as well. So that's not the case. So it might be a little bit worse in kind of perennial plants like alfalfa. Uh, case two is insects freeze, right? So insects uh, sometimes have the great ability to move, which means that they can actually find better uh, uh, kind of microclimate areas and move to areas that are a little bit better for them. But with these, these kind of massive warm temperatures and then extreme drops like we saw a couple times this year already, we might actually see kind of lower insects, lower insect numbers because of that freezing. And then case three is the one we're all really worried about, is if the insects don't freeze and the phenology is not matching, is not mismatched with the crop phenology, the insects might actually get a head start and thus could become kind of a, a worse or a bad insect year in those cases. And when we're thinking about alfalfa weevil, we know that the, the alfalfa weevils might become active a little bit earlier than typical. Um, we know that they lay their eggs in the stem of alfalfa, which actually means that if the alfalfa freezes, so will the eggs, which doesn't help anyone. Um, but because insect development is temperature driven, it really depends what kind of life stage, what are, are, are the alfalfa weevils in egg form? Are they in adult, adult form where they can move or are they in larval form when those freezes happen? Um, because anywhere above 45 degrees, the alfalfa weevil will be moving and starting to develop. And anywhere below 22 degrees uh, basically means somewhat instant death for these insects. And the hatch happens around 200 to 300 uh, degree days. But anywho, just food for thought. We're not really sure. We can't really look in our magic ball and predict the future, but it's definitely this uh, messy weather conditions um, definitely make it a little bit harder to predict insects this year. Thanks so much.